So uh, I want to lead a similar meditation um, like yesterday. And um, we are in these uh, two verses, verse two and three. And uh, both of them are talking about how to relate to patterns, how to relate to our reactivity. And uh, the first two, the kind of practice instruction, each first has like this little um, practice instruction is uh, leave your homeland. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. And the third first as has a as a practice instruction, rely on silence. Yeah. And I want to bring these two together. Leave your homeland and rely on silence. So leave your homeland can mean different things, and we can talk about it. We can hear it in a different ways. Uh, but Ken McLeod looks at it um, from a inner point of view. So he's not talking about moving, uh, changing friends or changing outer circumstances, but he's talking about changing the inner, the inner world. So for him, leaving your homeland means this. And I quote him, when you are able to experience these poisons and not act on them, you have left your homeland. So when you're not able to experience these poisons, so this refers to these, uh, to the three patterns of aversion, attraction, and indifference. Uh, but if you include the uh, uh, third first, so I would say patterns, yeah, habits. When you're able to experience your reactivity, your patterns, your resistance completely, when you experience them completely, and not act on them, yeah. So this and not act on them. So that's what we are looking for in our meditation practice: to be aware in an intimate way be with the energy, particularly with those um, which we feel uh, discomfort with, which we have aversion to, and we don't act on them. So that's that's what we that's what we lean into. So neither gra neither rejecting them nor grasping onto them. So leaving your homeland here means also to leave your comfort zone. So in that way, this meditation is a counter instinctual meditation because usually when there's some discomfort, physical or emotional discomfort in the energy of our body, we want to fix it. We want to get away from it or we reject it, we suppress it. So that's the homeland, this kind of reactivity. That's the homeland. That's the that's what we feel comfortable with because it's how, how we always do it. So that's the homeland. And leaving your homeland is uh, moving towards the places which scare you, moving uh, towards that which you usually don't want to move towards to. So that means leaving your homeland. And the idea is by doing that, you create the possibility that the silence, which is mentioned in the third verse, reveals itself and becomes available. So you slide more towards a peaceful experience because you relax your resistance, you, you put down your weapons. So your system can relax and open and you can gravitate towards a more peaceful experience. So 
So let's do that. And um, starting with uh, with what Lynn said. Yeah, so I will bring this simple appreciation and the joy of experiencing into our meditation. So you take your time to settle, and take your seats. And at one point, maybe your eyes want to close. <laughs> Maybe breathing a bit more, a bit, a bit deeper for a few moments. Not straining yourself, but just emphasizing the flow of the in and out breath. Possibly with the mouth slightly open. So if the air wants to come into the mouth and leave to the mouth and it can happen. And then the sliding or the dropping into your body. Down to your feet and becoming aware of the surface you're sitting upon and the out breath. Relaxing into that feeling that you're carried by the surface you're sitting upon. It's really like shifting, it's shifting gear from the conceptual way of living, usually being occupied with something from the past or the future. We're just gently sliding into present moment awareness. Past exists only in thoughts, future exists only in thoughts. And so this is like the most basic Buddhist practice. To leave the homeland of being drowned in thoughts, drowning in thoughts, being hypnotized by thoughts, so that's your homeland. And we leave that homeland by becoming more fascinated, more curious about reality. So the what is happening now? Sounds, sensations, breath, my voice, feelings. And a bit of anchoring with the breath maybe, or with the sensation in your hands or both. And then to support that present moment awareness, that possibility to be here, uh, sometimes it helps to just appreciate that you are alive. You know, remember that you are alive, something you have taken for granted today. But now we have this possibility for a moment to acknowledge that it is a miracle and a blessing, a gift. That, that there is experience that you are aware, that you hear, and that you are experiencing breathing. And in the breathing, we are deeply connected with 
nature, we are deeply connected with other human beings. So with each breath, we actually participate in the interbeing, into the interconnectedness with everything. And there can be a kind of thank you there. I just thank you and an inner smile just to the fact that you are alive and that you're experiencing you know, the joy of experiencing. And uh, notice the nourishing life spending aspect of the in breath. And the whole body is breathing. So, of course, there's the physical movements of the breath, but the whole body is breathing. The breath goes into your whole body. Let's see if you can bring that tender, appreci appreciative or curious attitude to the preciousness of this moment. I'm breathing, I'm alive. Thank you. Breathing in, thank you. Breathing out, thank you. And uh, not only you are alive, you have the capacity uh, of opening your heart, of experiencing the warmth of your heart. And we can extend that to each other here in our little group. Being together in this space as human beings with feelings. And including into that heart quality, particular your own experience yourself. So this warmth of your heart, your innate capacity to care, innate ca capacity of compassion, such a, such a treasure, such a blessing that we all have that indestructible source of love and wisdom, sometimes called Buddha nature. And then we call upon the presence of our teachers and mentors. And uh, we do that just uh, to enhance a bit that sense of unconditioned love, of big love, of, of, of essence love. So by calling upon our mentors, we actually call upon our own innate capacity. They are symbols or doors uh, into that experience for some. I mean, if it's not helpful for you, then that's okay. You don't need to force anything. But so some people, if they invoke an image of His Holiness the Dalai Lama or the Buddha or Jesus, 
they uh, they can uh, connect with these images and with the sense of a um, presence and enhance the experience of self-love through that so that you can relax even more. So now again, bit of an experiment like yesterday. What is it, what in your experience, in your immediate experience right now where you have the strongest resistance or aversion towards? And that doesn't mean to be, a, it doesn't necessarily is a big thing. Yeah? And of course, if you're really deeply fine with what is for you right now, then that's fantastic. So you don't need to make something up. Yeah. So, but if there's something which is either somewhat tense or restless or tired or numb, Some left over, maybe from today. You know, some stress which sits in your stomach or in your solar plexus. Uh, different, different possibilities here. So, and we leave our homeland by approaching that, by going towards the discomfort. That's leaving your homeland. So you breathe. So, and you do that together with the breath and with awareness, with your attention. And uh, there's a greeting in it. So, Hello, I feel you. And it's the greeting of a gracious host. So hello, I feel you. And sometimes just with that, it can be already a bit of a response. You might notice that. You know, there can be already like a bit, a little relief you know, by just acknowledging, but ju by just noticing, by just greeting. So the in breaths, you touch and hold gently without any kind of agenda. You know, what you want to heal, you need to feel. So that's what you do. Uh, there might be a, like a, there might be the sense of resistance at the same time, some kind of contradiction contraction around the experience and make that part of your investigation. So you also relate to that in an allowing way. And see if you can become, if you can get closer. Initially, there might be a sense that you are the experiencer apart from the experience, like 
maybe sitting in your head, looking down, and uh, see if you can relax that sense of separation. Be, being, aware, being aware of the bare energy of the bare experience so there, 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 there's less and less words less and less less and less labels so even, even the idea of pain or unpleasant so what, what is really there What's the energy like? And is there a clear boundary around the energy? Or is it quite spread and you can't really put a boundary around it? Breath and awareness is they 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 express a yes. Yeah, so yes, this is what is this is what I feel. And I am willing to feel it. I'm willing to be with it. Touching softly, holding gently, and then kind of waiting, not expecting anything. So you shine a loving awareness unconditionally. And the rest is not your business. So you put your money your trust into loving awareness. And if you need help, you ask for help. You ask Tara, you ask Jesus, you ask the Buddha, you ask your guardian angel or whatever works for you to hold your hand, to be there together with you. with an open heart, an open heart to your own experience. And keep the investigation alive. So you know, go closer, try to go inside. Explore the edges so your mind stays a bit vibrant and alive. And it could be that you even experience some sense of happiness uh, through self care. So, this moment is completely for yourself. So you give yourself the most important gift with breath and awareness. Just acknowledging, noticing, being aware and letting, be, letting it be. And thoughts are recognized as thoughts. It's fine that they are there, but stay with this sense of aliveness in your body.
and gently insisting to stay in contact, stay engaged. And sometimes by approaching an experience of discomfort like this, it kind of dissipates sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And then you let yourself just sink deeper. So then you allow yourself to fall into that which is behind that contraction. And maybe then something else appears and you do the same. Melting with breath and awareness, as if you're melting ice. And then you fall through into that which is bigger, into that which is behind. Everything is energy, non-static, vibrant, flowing. So what is, what is this without words? What is there without words, without memory? And uh, going inside, you know, letting go of the sense of separation. So again, leaving your homeland here means to leave the pattern of avoidance, of distraction, of not feeling, that's your homeland, towards embrace, allowing, letting be, feeling your feelings. together with the breath. And then let's add the insight that uh, doing this together. So each drop of healing, each drop of kindness, you drop into your own inner experience. You also drop into the group field. So we actually help each other. So in that way, you can also meditate for the others. So are you already meditating for the others? You share your kindness with the others by being kind to yourself. and returning and resting.
one of the images uh, Ken McLeod uses in his commentary, and maybe that could be helpful in this moment for you. He says to regard the content of your experience as swirling leaves in under a blue autumn sky. So whatever you experience within the moving mind, sensations, feelings, thoughts, sounds, regard them as leaves forming patterns and then being blown apart again, and then again forming patterns. And not distinguishing the different patterns for from each other, but seeing them all made from the same stuff. One taste. So these moving patterns of thoughts, feelings, sensations, energies, they don't have any meaning except the one you give it. So the image of the swirling leaves under the blue autumn sky is also that sky-like aspect of our experience. And that's what Tong Me Sangpo points to with the practice instruction, rely on silence. So I invite you to feel into with your intuition, with the intuition of your heart. Into silence. A silence which is always there. A silence which surrounds and pervades whatever you experience. A silence which is boundaryless and timeless. And uh, it's not about doing something or trying to understand my words. It's more that my words and this images, they might be helpful pointers for you. Is there <clears throat> in your direct experience now a sense of silence or peace. This is always there, but often not recognized because we are so busy with the content, particularly with the thoughts. And sometimes it's possible to dissolve or relax more deeply into that silence, a kind of a falling or a sinking, a sinking down. It's a bit like if you would be caught in the 
waves on a ocean struggling with them and then you let go and you sink down into the calmness of the depth it could be a little bit like that a silence which does not depend on your mind and your energy to quiet down and And you receive that silence with your whole body. There can be still a bit of anchoring with the breath or with other sensations. But uh, your heart goes into the opening to a spacious beingness, something which is bigger than whatever you experience right now. And that's what we rely upon. So that's our refuge. The inner silence, the inner peace. Which reveals itself when we relax the struggle with our experience. Rely on silence. So that means not to rely on thoughts, which is your homeland. And leaving your homeland is relying on silence instead, relying on presence, relying on essence love. And then if you have your eyes closed, take your time to allow them to open without the sense that the meditation is finished now. So you keep the rest in the body also. Just becoming aware if you feel differently now, so I think this. Uh, This counter-instinctual move towards discomfort
I think that's probably the most important, one of the most important aspects uh, in our meditation practice and on our healing path. What you want to heal, you need to feel. The only way out is through. Yeah. Or it's also for me connected with uh, the pith instruction of Machik Labdurin, that you maybe have heard from Pema Schödrin. One of her book, books is titled like that, Go to the Places Which Scare You. Yeah. And maybe going to some discomfort in your body doesn't scare you, but, you know, a little. So that's like the instruction to... So important. Particular for practitioner because it's very easy to use your practice to stay in your homeland. Yeah. Meaning to stay in disconnection, to stay in not feeling, to stay in uh, yes, to use your practice to stay in your comfort zone. And all every practice, a lot of practices. I mean, even breathing meditation can be used like that. You become very good in focusing your mind on the breath. But what you actually do is you distract yourself. You avoid to feel yourself. Helping others is often a way to actually stay in your comfort zone instead of try, trying out what does it mean if I don't help others and I stay with my own feelings and take care of myself first. For some people, uh, taking care of others is just another way to stay in the homeland of what they learned in their childhood it's not safe to look after yourself. You need to look after others. And uh, for many of us, leaving our homeland uh, could include, or has to include, uh, self-care and self-nourishing and looking after ourselves and setting health, healthy boundaries. Uh, so for some people, leaving their homeland is uh, maybe saying a bit more yes. Uh, but I think probably for most of us, uh, leaving our homeland would rather mean to learn to say no and not to put too much onto our plates. So I want to... Uh, Go back to the first two and just um, and just look at uh, two of these patterns, and that is uh, attraction and aversion. So Tonga Sampo writes, attraction to those close to you catches you in its currents. And I would uh, see this not only as people, yeah, but as you know, anything we we are attached to, so anything we want to have too much, anything we want to have more of, anything we are afraid to lose, and uh, it catches you in its currents. So it's always good in this uh, in these poems to um, feel into this. What experience is Tong Me Sangpo pointing to? Yeah. Where do you feel this that you are caught in the currents of attachment? Yeah. And so that would be, that's one of the important steps in the work with any kind of patterns is, first, we need to become aware of it. We need to get to know it. 
how does this, this experience of being caught in the currents of uh, uh, attachment, how does that feel? So we, we, are, we are curious about that contraction, that holding on, that fear, that wanting, wanting to have more, how does that feel? So I must say, just to uh, avoid some misunderstanding, this is not talking about uh, that joy and enjoyment is uh, wrong. Yeah? So it's talking about attachment. It's talking about the grasping. It's not talking about enjoyment and enjoying life and enjoying chocolate cake or whatever. It's it's this 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 grasping which leads to suffering. So what is important, particularly in the in the approach of Ken McLeod, that uh, the recognition or the awareness of this pattern of grasping, of attachment, the recognition of that is not judgmental, it's loving. That's really a crucial part. Uh, particular, having the attitude, which I shared with you yesterday, that all patterns, emotional patterns, habits, reactivity, all these movements, they are all energy. And they all have something to offer. So they all, the idea is to transform them into allies, not to get rid of them. And uh, Ken McLeod is sharing one of the methods to do that. He's actually sharing three methods, but I want to uh, look at one of them. But uh, before that, Aversion to those who oppose you burns inside. And again, to those who oppose you, I would, of course, include people, but also um, inner, yeah, inner uh, movements where you have aversion to. So aversion to those who oppose you burns inside. I think that's something we can all uh, recognize in, our, in us. Yeah? How tiring it is to, to oppose and even to attack. So particularly particular that, that energy of attack, that really burns. It's quite amazing to re to to get a. It, it's it's important to get a feeling. To experience yourself directly, how 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 hurting how you hurting yourself when you oppose others when you attack others. It's really painful. There's this analogy uh, in the sutras where the Buddha said, if you attack someone, it's like uh, bringing your hand into the fire and taking out the glowing coals because you want to throw it to, at the other person, but you get burned first. So these are the two uh, patterns. And the instruction, and instruction of or well, the invitation of Tong Sangpo is leave your homeland. Yeah, leave that, leave that way of relating to your experience. So, and then Ken McLeod. describes a short practice and this is actually a beautiful very conduct condensed way to bring uh, the teachings of the five buddha families into into the working with uh, 
the five uh, uh, with these uh, two patterns attraction and aversion. So the idea here is that each attraction and also aversion, they have a wisdom aspect. So, and our, our practice would be, our attempt would be not to get rid of anger, aversion, or get rid of attachment, but to transform attachment and anger into the wisdom aspect. So how do you do that? And I hope it makes a bit sense, maybe at least like intuitively. So when you see someone or something you like, let's say someone, I hope uh, we all remember how it feels to be attracted to someone. <laughs> yeah. Could you remember that? <laughs> yeah. And uh, sometimes if you get the Buddhist teachings wrong, then you know you might feel guilty about that or you feel like it shouldn't be or it's uh, it's something which uh, is um, an obstacle to your awakening yeah so let's remember how it feels to be attracted to someone it doesn't need to be in an, a romantic way but that could be a an, a, an example Uh, open to the whole experience, the person and the attraction in you. So that's the, the first in instruction to just open to the whole experience as it is, to the attraction and to the person you're attracted to to kind of just open to that without judgment. With attraction, you're aware of every detail in the person or the object. You are aware of every detail in the person or the object. So that's the wisdom aspect. I forgot the, the, the name of it, but the wisdom aspect is to be so filled by the vitality and the presence and the awareness, which the attraction brings us, you become more and more aware of every detail not only of the person you're attracted to, but all your surroundings. So you know, even the food tastes better, right? And the music becomes nicer. And the scent becomes more vivid. You know, so the attraction, if you let go of the grasping, of wanting to have actually has a, such a beautiful energy in it. If you allow, if you allow it. Probably that's also one of the gifts of guru devotion you know, where you feel the attraction to a teacher and it enhances your presence it enhances your vitality and your joy So that would be a, a good homework in the next days, you know.
uh, walking through New York or wherever you walk through and uh, being open to everyone you are only slightly attracted to you know, without doing anything. So this is not about flirting or uh, trying to uh, do something happen, but uh, like touching that spark of vitality, that spark of aliveness, which kind of can wake you up from being drawn in boredom and in kind of you know, the daily life drowning in thoughts like a, an attracted an attractive person can can give you that spark and you immediately kind of feel how the the cloud around your senses can can dissipate if you are uh, attracted to a to a particular person right now uh, like not just like a glimpse or something it could be also an interesting inter interesting thing to play yeah, with uh, to look at that person to be with that person to gaze in the eyes of that person to take in his his or her beauty and to open to the whole experience and not uh, acting upon it but transforming the energy of that attraction into a more a live presence. Okay, so I, I will say something about anger and then if you have some comments or question So he, he concludes this instruction with rest right there. Yeah? So that's the resting, rest, rest right there, rest right there. So with aversion or anger, your mind becomes very clear. Uh, so the wisdom aspect of anger in the teachings of the five Buddha families is clarity. And maybe that's also kind of, maybe you have a sense of what is meant here. Yeah? So we are talking about um, the possibility neither to act out the anger nor suppress it. So uh, it doesn't mean the practice is to hurt another person or shout, but to uh, feel and give space to the energy of anger, experiencing anger as energy, not feeding it. And then you might notice a sense of clarity, a sense of firmness, a sense of a sense of uh, saying no, or putting boundaries, putting health, healthy boundaries without uh, that hatred aspect, without wanting to harm the other person. So this is, I think for us a very, and it takes time of course to explore these uh, teachings in more depth, but um, and then practice it. Uh, but um, I think for us, it's really important that uh, we have a, a bit of another approach um, than the maybe more common teaching of that anger is very, very dangerous and, 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 and every act of anger is horrible and destroys so good karma, so much good karma. So just this change of attitude that there's a possibility to explore that energy. And it's very possible that many of us are more asked to 
explore a healthy kind of aggression and then uh, suppressing your anger through a loving kindness meditation or something or denying your anger, projecting it outside, that would be your homeland. And leaving your homeland would be experimenting with anger, um, giving it some space, uh, exploring other ways to new ways uh, to be with impulses of anger coming up. Yeah. So that's what can McLeod says about first two, leave your homeland. Is there any comment, any reflection? I really uh, appreciate how fine-grained you're being with each of these lines because I feel like when I was reading the book on my own, I was just kind of plowing through stuff and and sort of saying, okay, I understand. Mm. I understand. So I really appreciate how slow and careful you're mm. being. One of the, as you were talking about this thing of attraction and opening to it, I was also coming up with the, we often get an instruction to think, well, if there's something you're attracted to, to a person that to imagine them as a corpse, as a decaying corpse. And so you turns mm -hmm. it into a sort of a revulsion sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and I understand there's not a consistent approach because life is so complicated, but I'm wondering how you think about um, where these different instructions, what place yeah. they have and, and what time they have in our lives. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, first uh, to this uh, observation that there's a way to uh, read uh, these poems like really slowly and you know, letting it sink in. I think that's really good. And even the commentary of Ken McLeod is, I would say, it's not a text which you just read, you know, like uh, like you would read a book on Buddhist philosophy to collect some new knowledge. Because the 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 specific th thing for me in the writings of Ken McLeod is, it's all experiential. Yeah, it's 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 like sharing an experience. So uh, at each paragraph, uh, also in the commentary of Ken McLeod, is for me like I'm reading in the way I read with you now. Like really, like okay, what does how do I feel this? What does this sentence do with me first? What is my first response to it? And, and uh, can I can I recognize what is being written here in my own experience right now? Yeah. So that's 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 how I read. So it's not only it's it's not so much a, it's not only about the knowledge, but it's. It's also, it's, for me, it's an experience, entering, entering an experience when I read this text. Yeah, and then uh, I'm in this meditation, uh, which is an antidote towards attachment. Um, I think this is the meditation I dislike the most from the beginning when I got, when I, I mean, it didn't, I just didn't, I disliked it so much. And of course I was a man, so I, th this is like, the stuff you get on, on uh, even in the Tibetan tradition, yeah, because like in the, uh, I mean, Tibetan Buddhism is tantric Buddhism, but um, the tantric teachings are often not like what you get in the beginning, yeah. Uh, so, uh, in the beginning, uh, as a monk. This was the main instruction I got from teachers, you know, what to do was with desire, yeah? Uh, and here, a desire to, uh, to women, yeah, for me as, as a man. 
and I just I I, I don't I didn't want to do it. It's just like it was so. Uh, I mean, yeah. Um, but um, so, and then I was happy that I quite quickly discovered the five Buddha families teachings and, you know, also Lama Yishe's book on the introduction to Tantra, where he also writes about that. Yeah. And then, and then I start to see, you no, know, actually sexual energy in the Tibetan tradition is something sacred. Yeah. And, and in, 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 the, in the tantric teachings, you do the opposite. Yeah. You see the woman as a goddess. And uh, you, you in a relationship, you keep that view, yeah. So usually, if you can come closer to someone, you see more and more their mistakes, yeah, uh, and and they become more disgusting, yeah. But in in the tantric view, you you work against that. You continue to see uh, your partner as a, a as a as a god or as a goddess. And this initially, the initially sense that the other one is perfect, it's what you cultivate because she is perfect, yeah. <laughs> and and the 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 mistakes you might see, they are the projection, yeah. Oh, interesting. The, the, they they are what what you see because there's something there's something in in you, yeah. Something in you which you see then in the other. If you if you more you connect with your own purity, you see the purity in other people, and you see the purity in your partner. Yeah. Um, so, what what helps sometimes when when we get this kind of um, contradictory teaching? So it's completely. I mean, it seems like completely two different directions. Uh, to see them in the context of the, the Lam Rim, you know, with like different uh, uh, the the gradual path to enlightenment. How it's it's a presentation of the Gluck tradition in Tibetan Buddhism. It's like how they they arrange uh, the Buddhist teachings into like a a whole system. Um, and and if you study that, then you become aware. Yeah, right. There is so different people at different stages on their path, they need to have different kind of medicine. Yeah. And um, and in that way, one could maybe say say that uh, this teaching on the ugliness of the female body, and it's always the female body, of course, because <laughs> it's just like yeah uh, so I, I also didn't like that aspect you know um, uh, that that might have a place in in the mind of a person who uh, is really obsessed and can't let go yeah kind of to as a, as a kind of a, to create a bit of uh, relaxation around a strong grasping and obsession. Yeah? So maybe then it has its place. I don't know. I I I uh, I, I not really tried it. If, if it's like you no, know, you're supposed to take off the skin and get the hair off and stuff like that. It's like, I mean, this is like destroying a piece of art, you know, <laughs> like. Okay, I so said you have this beautiful piece of art made by nature, and uh, and then you are supposed to cut it, you know. Uh, it's like, but this is a teaching um, in for which might be helpful for some people, in particular maybe for monks. I don't know, could be. But it doesn't really help with the love part and the kind part and and uh, you know so 
it's I, and one can never be sure if it's that if it's coming from the Buddha or if some someone uh, someone later put it in there you know, because he hated women. He, he didn't. <laughs> A lot of the stuff in in the teachings is added by human beings. So helpful to hear your perspective on that. I really, really appreciate mm. it. I'm very mind opening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm. So yeah. Um, there is uh, one aspect to this: uh, leave your homeland. So I I um I now uh, came from Ken McLeod's perspective um, that it is about leaving habits, uh, approaching that which is difficult, going out of your comfort zone. Uh, but there could be also uh, a bit of a reflection here um, that we can also reflect a bit and feel into, it. and this point is a bit stronger emphasis also in the third verse uh, with a question which uh, areas and relationships and activities in my life are not supporting are not really aligned anymore with what i what i want to what i want to develop or where i where i'm heading towards to yeah so it can be also a bit of a reflection around uh, what kind of um outer circumstances in terms of relationships, in terms of job, in terms of where you live, in terms of what you do, what are your habits in daily life? Uh, are they wholesome and which are not wholesome? Um, so there could be also a reflection on that. Yeah. And that is that is more a long-term, uh, of course, consideration to more and more move towards um, a way of living which is supportive and um, to move more towards ki the kinds of relationships which are supportive. Sometimes we are kind of stuck somewhere because of a mortgage or uh, because we have children and then we need to stay in a job although we know it's not so good for us and we would rather like to do something else. I can see that, but there's always a bit of choice. Yeah? We have some, some choice. And this, uh, this, this letting go of what is unwholesome and moving towards more supportive environments can be quite scary because we are leaving our homeland. So even if the situation we are in, I mean, we all know that many people stay too long in relationships, for example, in certain relationships, where it's obvious for everyone around that it's not working. It's, it's just depleting. Uh, both parties, you know? uh, but we keep on. We you know it, it could be that that there is a bit too much tolerance to be uh, to be in discomfort, to be pressured, to uh, to keep to keep uh, being in a poisoning place, which is your homeland. So it kind of feels safe. And it could be that even in in the in, in the in like in terms of relationship, that if we leave a relationship, the we move into the same homeland, yeah, we move into the same kind of pattern. 
because it's home, it's what we know. So also they are uh, in this kind of, um, in this kind of uh, experiences, magic lab turns, pith instruction has been really helpful for me. You know, go to the places which scare you. Uh, and in a strange way, often that which will actually be more nourishing, more joyful, more creative, is first what we are afraid of, because we need to let go of our home. So, and we will be afraid. We, we are, we are, we are always afraid when we leave home. Even if home is really a shithole, we will still be afraid to move out of home. Yeah. And then when there is fear, not to experience that fear as a warning sign, we shouldn't move out of home, but rather say, oh, I'm afraid of this. Wow, that means I'm leaving my comfort zone. Ah, maybe that's actually the direction to go. Not always, of course, but be so go to the places which scare you. It's really uh, an instruction for meditators in our own practice, but it's also an instruction, like a guideline, which can help us a bit to navigate our uh, our decisions. If you listen to your fear, your life will become smaller and smaller, less and less development. And in the end, you will be locked in your room in your bed because everything will be, yeah, I mean, exaggerated, yeah. Uh, so if we don't move towards our fear or what we are afraid of, uh, or if we wouldn't have moved towards that, there, there would be hardly any development in our life. We were afraid to go to that school. We were afraid to change job. We were afraid to, go to, uh, to seek out another relationship. We were afraid to move to the other city. We were afraid to move to that other country. Yeah, But we did it. And that's where we learned. That's where we could expand. We were afraid to publish this book or this song or put ourselves out there with our project or something. We were afraid of all of that. So if we if we would have listened to that fear, yeah, we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have shared our song. We wouldn't share we wouldn't have shared what what we want to share in our life. Yeah, is there anything else to comment or sure, just that, look at? Yeah. On verse two, if you don't mind, some of what you're saying applies to this, but maybe it's a matter of degree. So I'm wondering about um, anger, right? And all uh, Ken McLeod says is uh, with aversion, your mind becomes very clear, rest there. Mm -hmm. But anger can become fury, right? It can become like a forest fire. Your mind becomes mm. very clear indeed. It's swept away. Um, in yeah. terms of energy, energy is is infinite. It's unimaginable. And so I'm having trouble understanding the advice to rest there, how you can possibly do that, and what beneficial mm. result would come from that. Mm. Um I, I I mean the 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 main idea again is to find that middle place between suppression and acting it out. So how to find a more yeah how to find that that place that middle that middle place between acting out and suppressing, giving giving space to that energy. Particular, 
if it's fury, like, yeah. I guess in, in, in a case of fury, what is needed to have a timeout, to get out of the situation. And then um, find a, find, <laughs> find a way. I'm just laughing. Something happened here, so I that's, I I laugh I laughed about someone else. Um, a, finding a way to uh, give some expression to that energy, but without harming someone with it. There's a teacher spiritual teacher, his name is Robert Augustus Masters. Uh, he, he, um, he wrote a paper on anger. And uh, in this paper, he, um, he describes a practice which he calls conscious rant. Rant, you know, like conscious rant. So it's, it's, it's uh, expressing and putting words on your energy and taking responsibility for it, being aware this is my feeling and the other person only triggered it. So you take responsibility for the feeling and you give it some expression and you stay in your body, you speak out what is unedited, what you want to say, maybe having a witness but but not the person you're angry with, but having a witness. And then, um, of course, that will move through. So it has its space, so it moves through. You, because you are, you expressed what you wanted to express, you, so you don't need to put more and more fuel onto the fire by thinking and thinking, oh, I shouldn't have seen, uh, so, so it isn't because you, you said it, you expressed it. And then trying out, okay, so then after that to sit down, do some kind of meditation with what is there. And then you see um, where I'm now with this, is this, can I recognize that they are, can I recognize what is meant with clarity? Maybe not, but uh, something has happened then. Yeah, The experience will be different. And then responding to the situation, to the person. Because that's part of the wisdom aspect of anger is some boundary was crossed. Something was heard. Probably something needs to be said. Because even if the reaction is like uh, so intensive, often because it's connected with the past, so often fury is not an appropriate response to the person and to the situation. It is a response actually from a very young part in us. So a, a, a furious response to another person is often not connected with the person and the situation itself because it's so clouded by our own old old wounds and and our habits and our fears, yeah. Uh, so that's why often angry responses are so over uh, so overpowering because something is hurt inside of us which has nothing to do with the person or the situation. Yeah, it's mixed, but nevertheless, something happened and something needs to be done. Some boundary needs to be set. Something needs to be communicated and it should be communicated. So the work with anger uh, shouldn't lead to our capacity to let everything happen to us because we can deconstruct everything and we can be with all our feelings. So 
You can stay with a person who is abusive because you are such a good meditator. You can transform everything. And there's no I anyway. Yeah? So who's, who's being hurt? Yeah. So, um, so the for a person in an abuse abusive relationship, it's so important for this person to become angry. And and uh, and set and set the boundary and set no, or get out of that relationship. Yeah? Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. But it, most most of all, it makes sense if that follows to the initial stepping back from the situation, or even removing yourself some, from the situation. Yeah, and that's and, difficult. Yeah, that's it difficult. Is. But it is in American law, um, that kind of emotional fury is actually used as a defense successfully, right? A crime of passion. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It, it seems exceptional somehow. Yeah. I experimented with Shanti Davis advice, at least this is how I heard it. Be wood. <laughs> I experimented mm. with that, which meant essentially for me to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. And it gave me time. I didn't have yeah. to react at the moment. I didn't have to deal with it at that moment. I think we so feel like, oh, this has to be engaged with right now. No, it mm. doesn't. I'm in a relationship mm. with this person. They don't mm. have to, you know. So I just thought, I mean, I don't always do that, but I love that B wood. <laughs> what is that? It means me just. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it... Yeah, that's that, that's the first remedy. But then one needs to do something more. Yeah? Yeah. So that's like a, okay. Yeah, time out, being like a piece of wood, like Shanti Deva says, yeah. Uh, but then going deeper, maybe with the RAIN model from Tara Brach, you know, investigating and, and so on, you know, different methods to go deeper. And it just doesn't have to be done at that moment. You have to reflect. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Yes. That's... Well, thank you. That, that's a kind of wisdom which comes with when we get older, you know? <laughs> we, we <don't, laughs> it's like, that's something we do, we discover in, on our life path. We don't need to, uh, it doesn't need to be now. Yeah? <laughs> I will see my husband also tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so leave your homeland and uh, rely on silence. Yeah? So that's that's the two like pith instruction from uh, these two verses. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thanks. And uh, Thank you. really appreciate it that you turned up <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to see you again. It and will thank be a you while, for staying I think. on. Thank you for staying with us today. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That was in the hand of the God of God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.